Hi, it's Bridget. Welcome to Sunday Morning Coffee with Bridget. How are you doing today? Oh, I know it's it's kind of hard to say, isn't it? It's minute minute by minute, it seems like. I want to be optimistic for the springtime. It's certainly got to be right around the corner. It's been very, very sunny here, but it's also been very snowy and cold. So I'm not really sure if I can get too optimistic yet. I'm cautiously optimistic. Let's just say that. I know some of my friends who are experiencing crazy weather across the United States. I, you've been in my thoughts. I'm just going to say that. Today's topic, um, I'd like to talk to you about death. Dun, dun, dun. Seriously, though, about our morbid fascination with death. I'm going to tell you a little story. So I re I've been realizing as I've been on my own journey of self-healing, I've been working on healing my psychicness, my psychic gifts, because I know that there's a lot of energy that I hold back in regards to my psychic gifts. And I'm starting to see, or it has become known to me as I'm writing about this, talking to my life coach about this, talking to my counselor about this, working on some shadows and some past experiences I've had. I'm starting to remember some things from, from experiences that I've had all along from childhood all the way up to adulthood where it's been like this bad thing to be psychic or it's this like shameful thing to be psychic. Now, not in the ways that you think of, not in the ways of like religion or challenged by religion, nothing like that. But in regards to the whole concept of death. And let me tell you why. Okay, so <clears throat> one of the things I can remember, I, I remembered because I was specifically working with um, my, any of my resistance around mediumship about being a medium because it's been a struggle since the, the pandemic started and, and I could feel all the people doing their mass exodus onto the other side and I just felt all this grief and it was very, very overwhelming for I'm sure many, many people, not just me, but so I stopped working as a medium in private session. And now I'm at the point where I'm like, I need to give myself some time here to heal some of this because there has to be something here. There's got to be my own personal resistance based on my own personal experiences and something that I'm attaching to this. It's not really a fear. It's just an incredible overwhelming sadness and grief energy that just feels super depressing and heavy. And it almost feels like never being satisfied. So somewhere along the lines, I've connected death with this feeling of never being satisfied, having it never be good enough. So at the point of death, looking back on life and not experiencing enough, feeling regret and, and never feeling quite complete, never feeling quite like it's been enough. Have I done enough? Have I done enough? Have I given enough? Have I achieved enough? Enough. So somewhere along the line, I've associated death with other people's value judgments about me and, and about life itself as a whole and whether or not I'm living up to the standard of what a life is intended to be. And this any kind of introduction of death is like almost perceived as skipping ahead and wanting to be done with the life, wanting to take a shortcut even though I never wanted to die or I never had like suicidal thoughts or anything like that at all. It was nothing like that. Somehow I have connected this energy of the meaning of death, the status of death itself as something that I should be, you know, it's like, um, feel kind of like, like, ooh, why would you want to do that? Like, weirded out by it. Like, oh, that's gross. Death is gross. Or, or, oh, that's so morbid. That's the word. The word morbid, morbid comes to mind. And here's how it comes from the story. So when I was in, what, like fourth or fifth grade, I got fascinated with the Kennedys. <clears throat> oh, yes. Not shocking to believe, right? Um, I think it was fifth grade. I think it was my fifth grade year. 
Um, that was when the JFK, it was like the anniversary, like the 20th anniversary of his assassination or something like that. It was like in the 80s. And yeah, it was like, yeah, it's in the 80s. And it was like the 20th anniversary, I think, maybe 25th. It might have been 25th. I can't recall exactly. And there were these miniseries on TV because they used to do that back in those days, watch a miniseries. We didn't have Netflix, you know. I know it's shocking to believe, but we didn't. And so we were watching these these miniseries. And there was this highlighted, these four days, four days was highlighted. Turns out it was a book and I asked for the book for my birthday that following year because this was November and the following year, my birthday's in February. And I wanted the book for Christmas and I think I got it for my birthday. And Four Days was about the morning after the assassination of President Kennedy. And I got so interested in what happened and in and, and his life, in, in John Kennedy's life, but in more so in what happened after his death and how the entire nation mourned. Now, I wasn't alive at this time. My parents were, but I wasn't. So they lived through it, but I was fascinated by it and how one person could have such a dramatic impact and how this collective grief happened. And I could feel into, at that time, fifth grade, I felt the grief. And it was years and years and years later, right? And I didn't know the Kennedys and I wasn't even alive then. And all the stuff that you might say about people like Freddie Mercury or Prince or Elvis or David Bowie, people in the afterlife that you might look up to or love, right? So I got to the point where I was so into this, this book and this story about what happened the four days after, the four days of grieving when the nation was grieving. And it was long after that too, but this book documented these four days. And some of the images were so profound in it. And there was this image that an artist rendered of a flag with like blood on it. And it was a, like a sketch. So I sketched that and used got out my markers, my fifth grade markers and and I colored it up and I hung it on my wall. And my mom was like mortified. My mom was like, oh my God, that is so morbid. What is wrong with our child? You know, she didn't directly say that to me, but I could tell that there were a lot of weird feelings about my, and concern over my morbid fascination with what was perceived as death, the death of John F. Kennedy. That was probably my first, uh, introduction into the mediumship energy and the fact that the things that I was experiencing when I was reading was very clairsentient or the psychic gift of sensing feeling, which many of you won't recognize as being an empath, being a highly sensitive person or being an empath, okay? And so looking back, I can see how all oh, this makes sense. This activated something. It was like a portal. It was this collective experience. I was clearly already psychic at that point and having experiences. <clears throat> so that was just one thing that I remembered in regards to, to death and in working on my psychic gifts. And so this fascination with death, it's not a fascination with death. I think it's more so a fascination with our spirit and our energy and life beyond the human form in this tiny little timeline that we get, this little chunk of time that we get and how our bodies decay pretty rapidly. Like in a hundred years, your body like just gives out, right? You, you can get new tires on your car, but you can't just, you know, replace all your organs, etc., etc. Well, who knows in the future, you know, with all the 3D imaging, we'll see. But, and you know, AI and all that, that's a whole nother topic of conversation. But for the most part, time is so short. And I don't think you really start to recognize that until you're middle, maybe middle-aged. Like now I'm at a place where my oldest child is now moving into her 20s. And so to me, I'm like, and I just had a birth and I'm like, oh my gosh. Like if I live to be as old as, I have two grandmothers right now that are 96. Yeah, I got good genes on both sides. Apparently the women, they way outlive the men. Let's just say that, way outlive the men. So they're both like 96. So. Theoretically, I could be only, only halfway through my life. However, the way I feel right now in my body and with my kids and the life, full life experiences I've had for myself and through them and their experiences, I clearly feel far older than I actually am physically, except for my spirit. 
the energy of me, the enthusiasm, the incredible joy that I can feel, the, the free-spirited energy that I feel, the creativity and the rush of like playful energy that I get when I come up with a new program or I offer a new service that I'm really excited about or I'm in a healing session with someone or a psychic session with someone doing intuitive coaching and we're doing some deep healing work and we're moving stuff and I just get so just oh so amazed and in awe of how energy flows and moves and the power and the perseverance of the human spirit and in the sessions I do like here on an above life channel right the readings and not readings it's not the right way to say it but the interviews that I do with the afterlife, the channeling sessions I have, it's just, I'm just amazed with the stuff that I hear, the wisdom, the the feelings that are just amazing. So I think that the fascination isn't with death. It's with the fact that our lives are so much bigger than what we can live in body, in, through our body and in our body. And so I think it's not this hurry to get to the finish line. I think it's more of this, and it's not even a fear. I don't think we have a morbid fascination with death for the most part because of the fear of it. Although I will say with, especially with my grandparents, with like the religious piece for them, there's very much for my grandmother, especially there's very much the sense of God and this fear of like judgment and criticism and, and comparison and all that. Not that she'll be rejected, but that, oh, did I do enough? Did I, did I live my life enough? Have I been enough? Have I done enough with the life I've been given? I think that death is this opportunity to look back and reflect upon life, and by then it's too late to change anything. And I think that there's a part of us, like that's why there's a rise of self-help and self-development movements and wellness and yoga and alternative healing solutions for people that deal with stress and anxiety and why we've seen an increase in mental health issues and anxiety and depression and impulsivity and autism and all of these other things that we've seen people come in born into life with and also people who've developed things over time because of all of these 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 interwoven interconnected experiences that Quite frankly, I don't think we'll ever really understand until we are not attached to the body. I think that's why things like astral projection are really appealing to people. Let's leave the body and have psychic experience and let's come back. Well, why would you do that? Then you're totally disappointed when you come back, unless you can integrate effectively, which good on you if you can. If you can, you're probably this master psychic medium or an incredible gifted healer that are you? Okay, if you're not, then don't be just jumping out of the body because the whole goal is to be in the body, to have a human experience with the benefit of being a spirit and to not have a life with regret or remorse at the end of it, but to acknowledge the cool experiences that you're having along the way. And even when they're hard, like Glennon Doyle says, we can do hard things have the experience, be present for the pain, even the emotions when you're sad, be present for the sadness, be present for the grief, because then it will not eat you alive. When you ignore it, it gets bigger and it creates a horrible shadow and that makes you feel less than, that creates fear. So death itself is nothing to be afraid of. It's the very fact that we are afraid to live. What's morbid is the depressing state of the not living, a life not living, not being lived, a life not being lived. Think about all the people that have died tragically, suddenly. Think of the people that have died of horrific circumstances, illnesses, disease. Live if not for yourself because you can't get out of your own crap in order to actually realize that your life has value and meaning. Live on behalf of someone else who got their lives taken from them, robbed of life. Don't you waste your life. Don't you spend your time addicted to stuff, avoiding your feelings. Show up and be in your feelings. And if you need help, guess what? That's human. Human relationship is part of this process. You gotta reach out and ask for help through counseling, through licensed clinical social workers, through crisis helplines, through friends, through community organizations, through religious organizations, through churches, through nonprofit organizations. Reach out again and again and again and again and again and again and again. Release fear and judgment and show up for life. Live it to the best of your ability. To the best of your ability. And then a life lived 
is a life that is successful. That has value. Living itself, in and of itself. Not a perfect life. Not the one way. Not the best way. But living. Just simply living. Day to day, to the best you can. You know, not everybody's going to be an Olympic athlete or a Nobel Prize winner. Guess what? That's okay. <laughs> That's okay. All right? Hmm. Let's get fascinated with life. Let's try that. How about that? All right? Okay, you guys. I have no idea how this Sunday morning coffee episode went from... Uh, talking about a morbid fascination with death to living life. But it has, and here we are. <laughs> Time to refill that coffee cup and get started about your day. If you've been able to follow my labyrinth of interesting conversation today, good on you. You're probably going to need a little caffeine or maybe a little more time sleeping in in bed, <laughs> cozied up with a good book or something like that. Uh, I hope I've inspired your spirit a bit, given you something to be hopeful about. Encouragement to live your best life. It's your life after all, so you have to live it. I can't do it for you. Just like you can't live mine for me either. So even though I do wish you the very best today, I do. <laughs> I really do. This is Bridget at Above Life Channel. Thank you for listening to this Sunday morning coffee podcast episode. I'm a psychic medium and an intuitive life coach. I like to share inspiration on both my YouTube channels, Above Life Channel YouTube and Fairy Grasshopper YouTube. Fairy Grasshopper is more of a casual vlog type setting where I also share some readings using card decks and other interesting psychic tools on there as well. If you're looking for me on social media, check me out as Bridget Inspired on Facebook and Instagram. Thanks for listening.